So, uh, wow, I haven't like shared my tabletop whiteboard in a while. All right, cool. So let's, um, you know, it's kind of stop action mode, but that's okay. So um, let me start off with like this. So the thing about learning something new uh, is that, well, let me just say this thing about learning in general is that practice doesn't always make perfect, right? Because you can be practicing the same bad technique over and over again, and let's use something simple like um, a physical sport like tennis or golf. I've, I've always been a big tennis player all my life, um, especially early in my life. I used to play tennis seven days a week, and I used to play um, USTA tournaments at the three-point 3.5 level. So if any of you guys understand that, you know, anyway, the point is um, if you continue to practice wrong and bad technique, you'll continue to make the mistakes. You continue to bake in the bad stuff, right? So practice doesn't make perfect. Okay. Perfect practice makes perfect. Practicing the proper technique. Also on guitar, you protect, practice your scales, but if you're picking technique, it's terrible, you know, the up, down, up, down, up, down. You're, if your picking technique is bad, you'll never get fast enough to do really fast licks. Just you can't because you physically don't have the technique. And if you continue to practice bad technique, you'll continually limit yourself, okay? So a lot of the stuff that I teach, um, it could sound like, oh, that's cool. The problem is when you don't put it into practice immediately and continue to do it, it might as well, you know, might as well be wasted breath on my part because you're not going to learn anything. You're not going to put it into practice and it all sounds good and you're all excited, you know, but I, but I promise you, you master these techniques, the very simple things, your closing rates will go from 50%, 55% to 75%. So you do the math in your head. If you can imagine closing 20% more of the people you're sitting down with, you know, now you can do brute force techniques like most of you do, um, thinking that that works. So you can do the, I'm so nice to them, you know, but being nice to them just means they can tell you they want to think about it easier, right? So let me just say this about learning and deliberate learning versus, you know, kind of the fake learning that, that people typically do when they they encounter something new, okay, is that there's this level of forgetfulness, okay? So, so this is the learning day. Okay, so these are like seven, this is days, okay? Okay, and this is, you know, a new thing that you've learned. Okay, and this applies to anything. It could be any of the products that we sell, anything that we do, okay, is that you, you learn something, let's say you learned it, day zero, okay, but then your level of forgetfulness drops off because if you never review it, it kind of does this, right? By the third day, typically this is why um, conferences have that three-day magic, that three-day excitement, that three-day thing. But after the third day, you know, like you come out of conference on a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, this is Wednesday, the, the effect of the conference is gone because you've never, you didn't implement anything new in what you've done. And the amount of stuff that you forgot, it just goes down to really, what is it, 20%? And this is kind of the 20% rule, right? 20%. And, and, and then, again, then again, if you never implement it, it goes down to zero, okay? Like, can we agree that that's the case? I'm going to open up my chat line so you can chat whether you agree or don't agree. If you don't agree, give me a compelling reason, summing on why you think you're right and I'm wrong. In my 30 plus years of going to conferences and, you know, it's, it doesn't matter how much you spend on conferences. Okay, great. I'm getting general agreement. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> uh, 
So here's the, when you learn something new, here's the, the deal. You stave off the forgetful part when you review it, you know, it starts to go down. Then day one, you review it, you get back. Okay, you, you review it. And then it, it gets longer and longer. Like it, it'll be longer and longer. You're gonna remember more of it, you know. But day three, you gotta review it again. But then the, the curve gets longer and longer, right? Day six, you review it again. And the curve over time flattens out, okay? Do you see how that works? So it's important to review, and I'm gonna send this video out so you can review this video again. I expect you to get the books that I recommend, right? If you wanna get good at this and you wanna really tear into the powerful influence you can have on people using these neurolinguistic programming techniques and the Sandler system of asking questions because Sandler is based on NLP. He won't tell you that, but he peppers all his stuff with NLP stuff that you don't know about. And it doesn't matter whether you know it's NLP or not. What matters is the use the, use the techniques that work. So I'm not asking you to be a, a master practitioner because you can spend five grand on becoming a master practitioner in NLP, which means you can counsel people on NLP. You can help people lose weight, help people get off drugs, help people um, get over PTSD. Like it's the power of what you can do with um, neurolinguistic programming. What I'm trying to do is just teach you basic techniques so you can get the bond report part. I promise you, if you get the bond report part down in sales, you will have master influence on people that you encounter. And it could be your family. If you want to influence your wife, these techniques will help you influence your wife or your husband, right? These techniques will help you influence your children. These techniques will help you influence all the people around you, agents that you're trying to motivate or agents that, um, uh, your upline who's trying to help you, you can influence them too. It goes both ways, right? And I promise you, they will never see it coming unless it's someone who, know, someone who uses it can hear it, can hear it. They'll see it and they'll feel it, <laughs> okay? Visual audio kinesthetic. I mean, but does this make sense to you? Like, you have to review this. You have to, and not only review, but put it in practice. When you put it in practice, then this curve starts flattening out a lot. So my point in, is that, you know, lock off now. Lock off now and don't learn this crap if you plan on not reviewing it again, because this would just be a waste of time. <laughs> Alex, you're so harsh. It's like, come on, man. I don't got time to be nice. I'm older now. I'm closer to the end than I am the beginning. Do you guys understand what that means? <laughs> right? Like, I don't got time to be mamby pamby and try to baby you through this thing just so that you won't get your feelings hurt. It's like, come on, man, you brought your toes in the room. I'm going to step on them. Okay. <laughs> it's so funny. Anyway, the reason, the reason being is that um, I used to teach this all the time. You know, if it was my child walking across um, a street and I see a bus coming, I'm going to grab my child across the collar. I'm going to pull him back hard. I'm going to scream at him or her, dude, you got to look both ways. What are you thinking? What are you doing? Right. And then for my agents, it's like, I wouldn't treat you like that because I've already got a relationship with my child. I brought them up, man. Okay. You know, I brought them in the world. I can take them out. <laughs> and then I used to teach, like, if you want to make, continue to make mistakes and fail, I'm not going to pull you out because you're not my kid. You know, I don't care about you as much as my child. I'm not going to pull you by the neck. I'm going to let the bus hit you. Okay. And then you learn from getting hit by the bus, whether you succeeded or failed. Okay. Because my job is to maintain a relationship so that when you, you know, um, get up from being hit by the bus, you either call me and say, hey, man, I need some help. Or you can just quit. Right. I'm at the point in my life and in my business where, like, I don't, I don't need any one person, right? What I need to do is make an impact on you. That's what I need to do. So I'm going to be a little bit more um, in your face 
because I don't got time. I don't have time on this earth, man. I need to make as much of an impact on all of you as I can right away. So I'm going to be a little bit more bold with telling you that, hey, dude, you're you're messing up. You're doing it wrong. You're not getting enough leads. You're not closing enough sales. Let's figure out what the heck's wrong with you, man. You messed up, dude. Like, come on. So I felt like, okay, now I don't care about the money. I care about you and getting you fixed. Okay. So um, you can agree with my methods or not, but um, I'm going to be a little bit more grabbing you by the collar and um, shaking you up and say, come on, dude. I'm not going to be mean. I'm not going to cuss you out. I'm going to like saying, well, you decide, man. If you want to move forward in the business and, and make great things happen in your life, let's partner up, man. Let's give you the best I got and get you in touch with all these great books and people and techniques. You know, but if you're, you know, continue making the main, continue to make the main mis same mistake by continuing doing the same thing you've been doing, well, then I don't have time for you. <laughs> Uh, that's about the nicest thing I can say. So has anyone quit yet? Has anyone decided to resign? <laughs> I hope not. Look, I really want to help you. Like God could take me out tomorrow. And if I have one person on this call to get their mind right on creating influence on another person, positive influence on another person, then I'm totally down with that. Okay, so I've given you a good enough reason why. Your why should be why should I learn this? It's like, so you can have more positive influence on people. You actually can use to have negative influence on people. But what I choose to teach is for you to have positive influence people, namely right now your clients. But if you're recruiting agents, mainly on your agents, right? Yeah. Um. Yeah, the NLP. Uh, yeah, so I'm reading your chats. I actually opened it up for everybody. All right, so let's just kind of leave it there. And then, man, let's um, let's rock and roll. So I'm going to share this PowerPoint with you um, that uh, will keep me on track and um, help me with, uh, whoa, let me take that and just share it. So, you know, your desire to improve and your desire to grow really should be the reason why, okay? So what is, what is it we're talking about? Well, the most important, in my opinion, be when you get in the door with someone to sell them something, to influence them, is you've got to do the bond and rapport, right? The bond, you know, the seven step Sandler system, <laughs> sorry, let me review that. I, I actually do know what I want to teach, but I forgot this part. Okay. So any of you watch my videos, you know, when I'm talking about the Sandler system, we call it the ATM submarine. It's the Sandler submarine, right? And it's taking a client through a seven step process, starting with bond and rapport. Okay. And these are all stuff I've taught. I've got a million videos on these upfront contract. Okay, I'm not going to teach the whole system, but I'm going to show you where this lies in the context of the Sandler system. Um, pain finding, okay? And pain finding goes into budget. These are all specific conversations of what you're trying to accomplish in each section to take a client through. The other thing about this system is it's designed to um, filter out pretenders. This is designed to not let you waste your time with fake people that are not, that don't deserve to be your clients. Decision. Decision process. This is where the close happens, by the way. And then this is fulfillment. This is where you do the quoting. And then the post sell. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Your job is to eject people at each stage that don't deserve to be clients, right? By the time you're done, you should have filtered out on our lead program. Um, I'll speak directly to direct mail leads. Um, telesales, the closing rates are different, but you, you can achieve 
you know, but on, on our direct mail leads, you should close 75%. So 25% don't deserve to be clients, right? And this process, if you're closing, typically a new agent will be at 55%. So we're going to get you 20% more using these techniques I'm going to teach you, okay? But you should get to 75%. On telesales, you know, this is probably more like 50, right? And brand new people are at 20%. Okay, it's just the way it is. It's just, and 50% comes from constant follow up. So you're going to spend probably three times more time closing a client on telesales than you would on regular in home appointments. Just how it is. Like, accept it. Grind on the grind on the desk. I'm not telling you not to do telesales. I'm just telling you walk into telesales with your eyes wide freaking open. You know what I'm saying? So this is designed to filter out the pretenders, right? If you don't use this system, then you're using the client's client system. What's the client system? So this is this is our ATM system, right? But the client system, what's the client system? Okay. The client system is they do a great bond rapport with you. Okay. Because they're going to make you think that they're they suck you in. Right? They suck you in. They're so nice. And then they tell you the pain they have. Alex, we really need to need this. I don't want my family, you know. And then you're quoting them. Yeah, that was um, a little annoying as far as the noise. Okay, you, they're telling you. They tell you their pain and you're like all going, oh, my God, I got a sale. And you're like saying, oh, man, this is done. I don't have to do that crap that Alex is teaching because I already got this sale. And then, then what do they do? You get all hot and bothered and then they give you the think about it stall. And then you leave a total loser. And you are a loser because you didn't help nobody. Right. You left them uncovered. They could die tomorrow. You're the loser. Because they gave you to think about it. They're so nice to you when they say, and when before they, and here's the kind of the, the thing that just, the, the, the dagger, when they turn the dagger, the turn the dagger part is they say, you know, Alex, you are the best salesperson I've ever, 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 ever encountered. Oh my gosh. I mean, if we're going to do anything, I promise we, Mary and I promise we're going to give you a call first because you are you don't put any pressure on us. And we just love you, man. I, you know, can we have some of your cards so that we can take, pass it on at church? And then, you know what, why don't we pray together? Because I know God sent you here for a reason. Let's pray together. Let's do an Our Father. And Lord, please help Alex continue to help more people out there. You know, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And then you walk out there a loser with your bottle. Hey, here's a bottle of water for the road. You're walking out going, what the heck just happened? How many of y'all been through that? Like, be honest. You know you have. <laughs> That's the client sales system. They sold you because they took your rights from you. They took your rights from you. So you're a loser because you could have helped that family, but you didn't. By the way, when someone uses that God told, you know, God tells us, we think about, go, you know, that's funny because when I prayed, when I, before I came in here, I prayed and God told me to protect you. How many of you all have the balls to tell a client that? Because clients will tell you that all day long to justify telling you they want to think about to do nothing. You need to have the balls to go in and say, you know, that's weird. Cause when I was praying over you before I came in, God told me to protect you. Then I just shut the heck up, shut the heaven up, and let them think about that one for a while. It's so funny how people are. So does this make sense? So the most important part, okay, that we're going to go over is bond and report because nothing happens until someone trusts you. The whole bond and report thing is it creates trust so that anything that comes out of your mouth is something they believe. Right. And I'll, I'll talk about that belief part. That's what that's what that's about. All right.
chat line. I offer to pray right there and then with them. Hey, that's a good way to do it. Lord, please open their minds and hearts, clear their minds from Satan, from preventing them from protect their families. Let's rebuke him right here, right now in, the, in Jesus' name. Um, let's cover us with your blood. I mean, do all the right stuff, man. You evangelicals are experts at covering people with the blood of Jesus to protect them from bad thought process that Satan injects in their brain. And you think I'm being facetious. I am not being facetious, right, Scott? Evangelicals are the best, are the best. I'm trying to teach my Catholic brothers how to do that stuff, right? So anyway, <laughs> Laura's cracking up. Yeah, yeah, talk to me about that stuff. We will fight Satan all day long, man. Okay, didn't mean to make this. Uh, it is a real thing, by the way. I'm not kidding. You know you got the enemy um, fighting against you, right? You guys know that. The stuff I'm teaching you here is stuff that God put inside you already, already putting stuff inside you. So Bon Rapport. Most important thing, because it creates trust with the clients that believe you. You cannot make a sale on anybody that you don't have rapport with, right? Because it's just a temporary sale. Even if you're so slick to sell it, they are going to cancel on you. And it is a chargeback that you don't want. That's the worst thing. Some of our top producers, when they start out the gate and they're killing it, I always wait. It's like, yeah, hey, good job. Hercules, Hercules, you rock, man. Good stuff. Proud of you. But I know they don't know anything about chargeback. Give it three months. Three months, you don't hear from that agent again. It's they quit because their business was falling off the books, falling off the books, falling off the books. They're getting chargebacks like crazy and they disappear. How many times have you seen people edified on the TWC? All of a sudden, you hear it. Now they're here and now they're not. It's because of chargebacks. It's because they they were they were taught some slick technique on how to close the client, right? And then the client, you know, gets rid of their policy. That's another reason why you want to learn this is how do you want to um, <laughs> how do you want to minimize that? And you do that through creating proper bond and rapport. Okay. So let's talk about what it is and and how to do it, right? As I mentioned, it's the first step in the process. Yeah, I've done this teaching so much. I probably don't need this PowerPoint, but it helps me. Oh, wow, I'm following it. But, oh, yeah, the fakey sales guy. How many times have you been, you've heard to walk in the home and look for pictures? Oh, this is a lovely picture of your family. Do you know how many people have said that it's their litmus test to see if you're like one of the window replacement salespeople because you go right to that picture. What a lovely picture. Is this your grandchildren? Oh, what are their names? Or you see a velvet picture of um, Dale Earnhardt. Oh, you must be into NASCAR. Oh, I love Dale Earnhardt. Man, you're too young to even know who Dale Earnhardt is, man. I mean, come on. Don't fake these old people out. They know you're fake. Totally fake. Some of them bait you too, whether you know it or not. They they know. They know your game plan. They know the deal. <laughs> they know the deal. So please, God, when you hear people, when you, when you hear people teach you that, they're obviously not Sandler. They're obviously not NLP. Okay, they're teaching you that fakey stuff that they learn, and that's why their closing rates suck. Okay. Can I be honest with you? All right. I mean, genuinely be interested. But if you're not interested, like, honestly, if I saw someone with a Fender Strat or Gibson or PRS guitar, dude, I'd be all over it. And they would know what I'm talking about because I would be all over it. So is that Gibson Les Paul? Is that the long tenon guitar neck or is it the short tenon? Like, what year did you get that? Does it have weight relief on it? Do you have the burst buckers, um, humbuckers in there, pickups? Do you have the 50s vintage wiring with the bumblebee capacitors or do you have just the regular wiring? Dude, they, they would know. I know what the hell I'm talking about when it comes to Les Pauls. Okay. Right. Again, not the fakey stuff that all, all those other agents out there do. 
Okay, so let's talk about some of the, the most important ones. And this is this is great sales training when you hear someone talk about mirror and matching. Or mirror and matching is one of the most important things you can do, whether it's tell the sales, which is why we do like to do Zoom calls so you can actually see the client, you know, of course it's better in person. But mirror matching was most important things. Why is that? Okay, so there are two types of mirror matching. There's vocal mirror matching where you match their voice, right? And then there's body language mirror and matching, okay? So let's talk about the vocal mirror matching. This is probably more important, by the way, the book, this book is called Develop Your NLP Skills. I sent this out, email blasted this out. One of the best books on teaching basic, basic, basic NLP sales techniques that you can implement today, right? NLP, I've got, she's 50 books that are really thick on doing all kinds of NLP techniques. This is by Andrew Bradbury, right? You can get this on Amazon. It's really cheap and it's real thin too. Look how thin that is. I measure books by how thin they are. This will give you some of the best teaching on basics, right? So the mirror and matching, um, you can mirror their voice, tone, and tempo, right? So what does that mean, voice, tone? So if they speak fast, they like really fast talker like this, typically that means they're a visual person. So visual people talk really fast because they're trying to articulate all the pictures in their head, right? They talk real fast. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm talking real fast. I've got you know three hours of material to cram into the next half hour, okay? So when you're on the phone with someone or when you're in front of someone, you want to totally match their rate of speech, right? Off to all too often, you think here, and here's how I know if that person, the way they speak drives you crazy, that's how you know that you should be mirroring matching their tongue, their, their rate of speech, right? Like, golly, Alex is talking really fast. You know, but if you're talking to me when I'm talking really fast, you better talk real fast too. That's how we create rapport is you speed up to them. Okay. Now, if they tend to talk real slow and, and you want to speed them up, typically what a salesperson will do is speed up talking because they want, you know, they want that person to match them. So how it works, man, you have to slow down like them. And I promise you, when you're talking slow, you are not near as slow as they are. Because you're going to want to go back to how fast you speak. So you have to be deliberate. What I love about using NLP techniques is it causes you to totally focus on the client in every way. And gosh, if I could just get any of our agents to focus on the client stuff, focusing on themselves, because you know, most new salespeople, they go in there and they're thinking about themselves. You're thinking about you. You're worried about, can I close this client? What do I do about underwriting? You're worried about you, 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 not them, them, them. What I love about learn, learn neuro-linguistic programming and using these techniques is you totally focus on them because you have to study how they are and you're looking to mirror and match them every step of the way. Honestly, it's like trying to speak Arabic to someone who only understands Chinese. You know what I mean? Like you can talk Arabic, you can talk Arabic really loud. Inshallah. And the, by speaking louder doesn't mean that Chinese person's gonna understand you. Actually, I'm watching this great series called Tehran right now. That's a great spy series. Half of it's in Arabic. So you can't fall asleep because you got to read the subtitles. Anyway, that's why I mentioned Arabic, Farsi, actually. Well, Arabic and Farsi. Anyway, the, the bottom line is if you don't mirror match, then you're going to speak in there a different language they don't understand. The whole idea, and I'm telling you that this is percentages. The percentage that you amp up your bond rapport means you have a higher likelihood, higher likelihood of winning, winning and helping them, right? And so you focus on them. So how fast are they speaking? You cannot try to speed someone up. You've got to match them on rate of speech. Does that make sense? So you got to slow down, right? Tonality is the same thing. You know, if they talk real bold and 
you know, just real affirmative, you need to match them the same way. You need to match that tonality. Yes, sir. I understand what you're saying. You know, then you got people that are just sort of laid back. They're, they're kind of amiable. Oh, yeah, I see. I think I remember sending that in. Oh, you do? Oh, great. Yeah. You're laid back. You're that laid back Californian. Okay. If they're that laid back Californian, you're that laid back Californian. <laughs> Shaka bra. Do you, so, you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, now, look, accents. If they got a, a Southern accent and, and you have a natural, like, let's say, for example, you're a transplant to Yankee land, you're originally from the South, and you know when you go to Christmas, you go for Christmas down the South, all of a sudden that accent comes back. You go back to New Jersey, the accent disappears. So you have every right to go slip into that accent when you're talking to someone from the South, right? Every right to do it. Now, if you are have never been to the South, you've never had sweet tea, right? The most you know about Southern accents is Dukes of Hazard. Well, then don't do it. Don't fake it. Don't fake that crap. You know what I'm saying? But if you do have that, if you can, you know, genuinely mirror the accent, then, you know, I'm all about it. You need, you need to do that, right? Here's the other thing, especially when you're with them in person. This, okay, so why do you do mirror matching? Why you do mirror matching is because it gets you into their head. There's this, the whole base of NLP is to know what your client's thinking. All the stuff we're talking about in Bon Rapport is you will feel what they're feeling because it creates this, you know, RS-232 Ethernet connection from your brain to their brain, your heart to their heart, you know, your stomach to their So You're going to know when there's sales tension. You will know when they're wanting to back away from this. You will know all the cues because you feel what they're feeling. You'll be so, it's like a Vulcan mind meld, you know, for all you Star Trek fans. That's the power of NLP. This is why you need to implement this so that you know exactly what your client's seeing. How many of you would like to be near a client's head, right? Wouldn't it be an advantage to know what the client's thinking? Well, the NLP and using that te these techniques will be that for you. You will get into their head. You will feel that sales tension. By the way, sales tension is not a negative thing. What you want, what you got to be afraid of is passivity. If there's no emotional tension, then you know you got to amp up what you're doing, okay, in order to feel what they're feeling or if there really is nothing there emotionally on them, right? So this is why you do that. Mirror matching allows you to get into their heads. And I'll tell you what, it works, man. Because when you got the ultimate bond rapport, then they do what you do, okay? I'll get into that a little, a little bit later. That's what you want to do it. Breathing rate. Really cool. You know how sometimes when you're doing um, exercises with a uh, yoga instructor or something, they teach you to do breathing techniques. And what's really cool is that if you're so in tune to your client, one of the best ways to bond rapport is, is matching their breathing. Just like matching their breathing is really cool. It's, it's like when you're singing with someone, and you both are singing different time signatures, right? You're just lagging behind them. You don't sound like one person. It sounds like, it sounds off, right? Because one of you is not on beat. But when you're singing on beat and you sound like that person sounds, you match their volume, it's, it's heavenly. When you got two people singing, it's like the Beatles. When the Beatles sang, you had John Lennon, Paul McCartney, they sang together. And when you heard them together, it sounded like one voice, but you knew it was different. There's this beauty in that. Breathing the same pace that they're breathing is, is exactly the same thing. Okay, body movement. This is amazing what happens when you mirror their body language. Right. So there's uh, some great teachers. Uh, gosh, what's that guy's name? Alan Pease that has several great books on body language. You know, body language, you know, body language, you can read how someone's feeling by watching their body, body language, but sometimes you misread them, right? Because someone's like this, right? They're sitting across you. They're like this, that the body language tells you that they're close to you, that they're not open to listening to what you have to say, right? Or they might be freezing cold and they're just doing this because they're cold, okay? 
the reason why you need to mirror exactly what they're doing is that it will allow you to feel whether they're cold or whether they're, clo they're truly closed off. So um, like, let's say the husband is like sitting with his legs crossed, his right leg crossed over his left. And so I speak to set, when I speak to the husband and he's kind of leaning back. So what I'll do is like, so Joe, and I will cross my left leg over my right because it's truly mirroring them. So I'm going to cross my left leg over my right. I'll sit back like he's sitting back. They say, so Joe, tell me what would happen, you know, when you die tomorrow, how would your family, how would your family deal with it financially? And you're like sitting back. You have to, and they, what's funny is they will never know you're doing it. They will have no clue that you are mirroring their body language. And then when you talk to Mary, Mary's kind of like her hands are folded and she's leaning towards you. So I'm talking to Joe and I got my legs crossed and you can't see that I have it, but I'm doing it anyway. Right. And then, but I so Mary, I go, you know, I'll put my hands on the table. I go, so Mary, tell me about your situation. You know, Joe's dead. So he doesn't get to talk. So tell me how long we'd be able to keep the house payment going. And you are like mirroring her. She won't know that you're doing it. Why? Because most people are in their own heads. Most people think about themselves. Most people aren't aware of you as much as they, you know, so they will never know. And you do it subtly, but I promise you it works. The, the whole mirror matching works, body language wise. Now, how do you know? There's a test that you can do if you've got the ultimate bond rapport is you break out of the mirror. So you're doing this with her. So you, when, you, when you like you're talking to Mary and then you go like this and you kind of sit back. When Mary does that with does that too, you got her. You got her in the palm of your hand. Anything you do or say at that point, you can totally, 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 I don't gonna say manipulate, but you totally influence her because it's called pacing and leading. Okay, in the NLP world, it's called pacing and leading. So you're pacing by mirroring them and matching them. And then you're leading them by breaking the posture and then they follow you. It's, it's like magic. It's, I'm telling you, it's the coolest thing once you master it. You can do it in a few minutes, honestly. Some of the best NLP people, salespeople can do it in about three minutes. They can do it. And then they test the rapport and it works. It's it's incredible. That's how you know you got someone, you know, anyway. So this book has a great thing, uh, body posture, you know, um, and so on. Tone, tempo, breath. Watch my hands. Okay. So that's mirror matching. Okay, you ask the questions, okay? One of the most important things to stay in control, and this is kind of really beyond, a um, little bit beyond NLP, um, this is more uh, Sandler stuff, but um, you being in control, hold on. Yeah, had to control the mute. You're the one that asks questions. It's really interesting. Again, like I said, people are more interested in themselves and less interested in you. So when you get them talking about themselves, you are in total control. You know, I've been in parties where I didn't do the talking. I let them do the talking. They think I'm the best conversationalist in the world when I ask questions. And I'm and when I ask questions about people, I'm sincerely interested. So it's this quality I've had all my life. I'm really interested in people. I'm really interested in their stories and things about them. And I may never share anything about myself, but they think I'm like the coolest guy in the world, right? And now it's important for you to share stuff about you because this is a great book by Chris Voss called um, Never Split the Difference. And Chris Voss talks about in hostage negotiations, it's important to share, find out about the, the um, it's kind of funny analogy, hostage taker. 
But, you know, the negotiator, they need to know about the negotiator. There's this thing when they know about you, when they learn about you, they care about you. That's just kind of how it is when you can relate a, um, a story that's similar to theirs or that can relate to them. You know, that's how you um, create um, that control. Here's the thing about NLP is that, um, I'm getting a little bit ahead, but you've got three types of people, basically three, there's four types, but three types mainly. You got people that process information visually. You got people that process auditory by hearing. You got people that process by feeling, okay? It's erroneous to think that everyone thinks in pictures, okay? That might be true in thinking about stuff. When I mention, you know, blue ice cream, what do you think? You visually, you see a blue ice cream cone, right? I didn't even say cone, but you automatically put it in a sugar cone, didn't you? Right? It's the power of visualization, but you processed it by hearing, you process it by visualizing. So there's three ways of bringing information in. There are three ways generally people do it. Visual, audio, kinesthetic. Kinesthetic is feeling, V-A-K. You're going to hear in the world of NLP, V-A-K, 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 VAC, right? And so if you're already talking to a visual person, you're going to, that in your visual, there's going to be no, you don't have to do anything different, right? Because you're going to create rapport with them because they talk in that little visual language all the time. The problem is when you're talking to a kinesthetic or an auditory, your visual, again, you're, you're talking, you know, they understand Chinese and you're speaking Arabic, right? So you can only relate, and I say 25%, just as a number. How would you like your randomness of who you sit in front of to be the determiner of whether or not you close that person? I wouldn't. That means that about one of every four, three or four houses, you're going to already have bond report just because you're like them. Man, I don't like those odds. How would you like to only close one in every four person? You're going to four people. You're going to be broke. I promise you, you're going to want to quit. That's why you got to be in question answering mode, asking mode, and getting to the idea of maximizing how can I relate to this person better. Um, look them both in the eyes, right? Um, give the wife her due. A lot of guys would just totally, because they're male, they'll, they'll just totally be into the husband, and then they totally ignore the wife. Trust me, you wives know, you know when a salesman's ignoring you, don't you? Right? Now, the husband won't know, won't understand you're ignoring him by talking to the wife because you're talking to his wife. Not that you're, you know, you're talking to the wife. You're giving her her due. You spend more time. If you're going to err in judgment on who to talk to. You're talking to the wife, man. I'm telling you. It is a gender thing, man. Total gender thing. She's the one, she's the one, man. She's the one that can cut his legs out from under him. I mean, I learned this when I was dating girls. That's funny. When I was dating, I knew who the power person was when they eventually get to meet the parents. I was all over the mother, man. Because when you're dating the daughter, you're dating the mother. Trust me, I know. <laughs> Lots of experience. When, <laughs> when you create bond report the mother, man, you've got the daughter and then you're in, you are totally in until you break up with her. <laughs> then the mother hates you. But anyway, <laughs> that's a whole nother thing. Uh, but you look them both in the eyes, looking in the eyes. How many people trust someone that's just like shifting their eyes all the time and they're not looking at you? You don't trust anyone like that, right? Um, our... Alliance training manual, um, the about me slide out, you know, I'm not going to go too much in about this, but um, the whole idea, the Alliance training manual about the about me page is to share stuff about you, but it's more about finding about them. So when you go through that about you slide, those are questions you ask them when you share about you. Okay. I'll just cover that. Okay. Not okay. Okay. This is a, another Sandler technique. Here's, this is what the okay, not okay. This is the transactional analysis um, type of um, relating to people. Okay, not okay. So what this is, is how many of you get around someone and they're just bubbly all the time? 
you know, you, they come up to you and you ask them, hey, so how, how you doing, Joe? Oh, man, I'm doing so awesome, man. I just closed a huge deal. I made 10 grand yesterday and I am just killing it. I'm actually looking at some Porsches, brand new Porsches that I'm going to buy because I'm going to make enough commissions this month to totally buy it by cash, man. I'm so fired up. You know what? My kid's graduating magna cum laude from, from college. And they got this great internship set up with one of the top accounting companies in the country. Oh my gosh, they're just doing something awesome. And oh, you can ask me about Ginny, but let me tell you about Ginny. Ginny, how many of you like run into something like that? And the more they talk about how great life is going for them, the more you feel like, oh my God, I was having a good day, but I'm not having as good a day as that person. I'm a slob. I hate myself now. You know, let's go shoot up or let's, I need a drink. <laughs> See, when you're, when you become way okay, you help someone become way not okay. And so one of the standard techniques is the okay, not okay transactional analysis is you never be better than your client because you make them not feel good. If anything, you want to be worse than them. You want to be more not okay right? Not depressed, you know, like, actually, you can take this to kind of an extreme, but it's a, like, run around the block once and then come to the house and knock on the door. And you're like, oh, man, and they get to the door and you're just kind of, you know, you're a little bit to show us. go, hi, hi, Joe, this is Alex. Oh, man. Hey, it's good to see you. I'm sorry. I'm, um, I'm just having this great Incredible, crazy, crazy day today. You know, my, my car ran out of gas and, you know, I, I had to get it. It was just nuts, man. I, I hope your day is going way better than mine. Just little subtle things that you are not having this awesome day because you make them feel worse. You want to make them feel like, wow, I'm having a great day compared to Alex, right? Now, don't sound like, oh, well, I'm going to go after this appointment. I'm going to go to the bridge and... I'm going to be thinking about killing myself because I just want to end it all. No, come on, man. But don't sound so bubbly like, oh, man, I'm fired up. This is a great day. It's a great day to be alive. Praise the Lord. Give me another day to serve people. Oh, my gosh, man. You're totally blowing it. How many of y'all are like that? <laughs> people are not going to like you. That's for sure. Oh, man, I love this. Don't beg. Here's the thing about when you interact with clients, you can't be a beggar. You know, you don't need anyone. It's better when you use the system, the submarine system to, to eject clients. It's not about closing. It's about measuring each step along the way, whether or not this client is worth being a client. You're qualifying the client for your time. Your time's valuable. You need to know if this is a real client or a fake one. And as soon as you identify they're a fake client, I'm out of there, right? I'm, I am totally out of there. They don't have to sell me too hard on them not being a good client for me because I don't need anybody. It's so much easier. Oh, my gosh. It's so much easier selling people that you don't need. You don't need them. You know, like you think when I recruit agents, do you think I need any agents? I don't. The way I'm thinking is like, oh, my God. I'm going to be investing time in this person and money on leads. Is this guy going to, is this throwing pearls to swine or not? Gosh, you don't know how many times I've been screwed by agents that promise all of these things to me. Oh man, I'm going to call those leads. I promise that I'm going to call those leads. And you get those leads for me, man, the best leads. And I promise you, and they sell me all, they, they have sold me a lot in the past, not all the time. And then I get them leads and then, Hey, man, I don't hear from for a week. In fact, they avoid me. They avoid my calls. They don't call me anymore because they're not doing good with the leads or they just don't call them. And they, they think I'm going to be judgmental. It's like it's worse when you don't talk to me. I'm judgmental when you don't call me because I know that you're embarrassed because you're not making the dials or you're embarrassed because you're not getting the results. And it's like I got you those leads so that you can get results, but I want to know you're working them so I can help you. If you never ask me for help, then I'm going to assume that you're going to be one of those losers that took my money and you ran, right? And so do you think that I need any agent? I don't need those kind of agents to screw me. 
right? So every agent I'm talking to, it's not about, well, some of them, I bring them in because they're, they've got people underneath them that I can find. So sometimes they're a doorway to other people. If I think they're a doorway, they have a good, I think they're good quality, I can get to the warm market. That's the only reason I keep them around. Alex, that's pretty harsh. No, oh, come on, man. I'm a business person too, right? You know, be crafty. Isn't that the Lord says? Be crafty because you're living in the world. So you got to be crafty. Anyway, bottom line is don't beg. You don't need anybody. You don't need anyone's sale. The minute you think you need a client's sale is like the minute you need to call me and get your mind right about that. Does that make sense? Yeah, by the way, this confidence comes comes from doing like a million sales calls, right? So you earn this. I don't expect you to be like this. I earned it. Every top salesperson earned it because they didn't quit. They persevered. And my, my advice to you is persevere through it so you can earn the confidence. It's incredible. You can't have confidence right away, but you can fake it till you make it, right? Visual, auditory, kinesthetic. Okay, like I said, people process information in one of these three ways, typically. Okay, and so how do you know how to speak to someone, right? Well, it's the words they use first of all. So visual people will you will use visual words. So the first clue is how they talk, how they describe things. Yeah, Alex, I, I see what you're saying. How do you see what I'm saying? A visual person will say, well, I see what you mean. You can't see what I mean. You hear what I mean because I said it, you heard it, right? But they don't process it like that. They process it visually. I see what you mean. So that gives you a clue. They talk visually. So you talk visually too. Like, okay, Joe, imagine you die tomorrow. Picture your wife and children, children, you know, Mary. Martha, Hannah, and Abraham. Nice Jewish family. Picture what they would have to go through. Now, if they're not visual, you're speaking Chinese to a man. They don't speak Chinese. You know what I'm saying? You need to match how they describe things because that's the first clue. Auditory person, wow, that, you know, that sounds really interesting to me. Yeah. So you, you match their, how they describe things like, do you hear what I'm saying, Alex or Joe? Joe, do you hear what I'm saying? Now, you're, if you're a visual person, that sounds weird to you by using like auditory words because you're not auditory, but you're speaking their language that matches how they process information. It's so important. The only way you can do that is by practicing because it's, it's against how you are and that's the beauty of this is that you'll, you'll gain rapport with so many people and you speak their language. It's also in here. Um, they've got this real detailed auditory, yeah, persuasion techniques. Oh, this is, this is a great chapter. Anyway, you got to get the book. So the words they use. So a feeler is someone that says, oh, man, this just doesn't feel right to me. Oh, Yeah. Well, let me explain this to you, Joe. How does it feel if I blah, blah, blah? How does it hit you? Tell me the impact to you and your family. Give me a sense of what do you think this will happen? How does it, how would it make you feel, right? Use those feeler words, man, feeler words. It's an important, it's something you gotta practice, all right? And you gotta, this has, all the words, so I'm good. I'm not going to go into it. IQs. So the other way is IQs, and this is the most fun one. This is the fun one. Um, yeah, let me. Okay, IQs. So what are IQs? Let me uh, share. This works for every culture, except for. Um, People that speak, uh, is it uh, Catalan? Catalan, that's um, in Spain. It's like this province in Spain. The Catalan people don't, they don't exhibit these, these things. So 
you got three types of people, okay? Okay, this is neutral. They're looking right at you. So visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, okay? So when you, a good way to test someone is ask them to recall something. So this is the recall mode. Okay, so when they're um, um, recalling a true memory, this is how you can tell someone's lying to you, by the way. This is all the keys to know if your kids are lying to you, totally. Okay, so when you ask them, so tell me about your wedding, like, tell me about, like, if you're, if they're auditory, tell me about, what's the song you played? Or how did you meet each other? And if they look up to the right, as you're looking at them, they look up to the right, they're visual. Because they're recalling a memory, their eyes are going to dart up to the right, or to the right, as you're looking at me this way, right? They're gonna go up like this. Well, we were at this bar and they're gonna look up. If they're auditory, they're gonna look to the right sideways, like to their ears, right? Their ears, okay? And then if they're um, kinesthetic, they're actually gonna that's one thing about kinesthetics is they look down regardless. Okay, <laughs> they're gonna look down both ways. Okay. Now, if they're trying to imagine, it's like, so here's a. If they're just trying to imagine something that's not actual, then they're gonna look up the other way, which is really cool. This is a really cool. So they're gonna look up the other way. So this is how you know they're lying. So when you're talking to your kid and they say, "Did you spill this, Athen?" And he's going to go, no, I didn't. He's going to look up to the right if he's visual, if he, you know. But if he goes, no, I didn't, and he's looking up this way because he's, he's, he's not telling me the truth. Or, you know, if it's auditory this way, then kinesthetic, it's a feeling thing. They'll also kind of look down. Sometimes kinesthetics, you can't read as well, right? especially kinesthetics, because they can really feel that their the falsehood is true. So that's more difficult. So imagine recall. The bottom line is when they look up, either way, they're visual. If they look to the side towards their ears, they're auditory. Okay, They look down their kinesthetics. That gives you a clue on how to talk to them. Okay, So for example, the visual... I see what you mean. Yeah, that looks good to me. Show me more, right? Those are visual type words, auditory words. I hear what you have to say. Wow, that sounds good to me. Tell me more, tell me, tell me more, right? Kinesthetic, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I feel good about that. Fill me in. Fill me in on the details, right? So that's just an example, right? So here's um, an example of a conversation that's not going well. <laughs> it's not going well. So this is where your primary, um, what do they call this, representational system, your preferred representational system. So this is a conversation. So this is Jim. Jim says, have you looked at those papers I showed you? Anne, Anne says, I'm afraid I was tied up with other business all day. Jim, you mean you didn't even glance at them? Anne, you didn't tell me they had to be dealt with in a hurry. Jim, well, they do. Now, when am I going to see some action? So you, you tell me which is which, right? See, clearly Jim's visual, but Anne is more um, kinesthetic, isn't she, right? So this is uh, book ordered. <laughs> Good job. So this is when everything's in sync. So Sue, so this is Sue and Tom. Sue says, have you looked at those papers I showed you? Tom says, not yet. You must have seen how busy I've been today. Sue, 
so you haven't had a chance to glance through them? Tom, no, I haven't. But now that my desk is clear, I'll give them my full attention. Clear. <laughs> Sue, that's great. When can I expect to see your report on my desk? <laughs> Do you see how it is? And if you ever hear me, when I'm talking to a group, I try to use all the different ways of, um, because everyone hears it and sees it and feels it differently. So again, you mastered this stuff out of this book, man. This will rock your world with um, stuff. Okay, the other book, um, this is a great book. This will actually give you exercises so you can practice. Um, the other book, NLP book is called How to Make People Like You in 90 Seconds or Less by Richard Boothman, like phone booth, booth man. And that is a great book because he gives you very specific. So if you want to go to the next layer, so get this book first and then get that book, How to Make People Like You in 90 Seconds or Less, second. Okay, then the book that is the foundational book on asking questions is Asking Questions the Sandler Way. And I put I put the link. It's like 16 bucks. And they're all very thin. They're, they're all very thin. And so I'd recommend um, those three books if you want to master, totally master the art of influence, the art of sales, right? So that is it, man. You you do this. I promise you, your closing order will go up 20% like that, and you don't even have to be understand how this works or why this works. And I would encourage you to Google YouTube on NLP techniques. You'll totally be a fan person on it, fan boy, fan girl on it, because when you see some of the powerful things you can do with it, it's amazing. You can really put pictures in the other person's head, right? When you take NLP to the ultimate can, um, level, you can get people feeling that they need to take care. You get people visualizing the problem they have. They want to take care of it, right? They're going to hear you. They're going to hear what you have to say. And they're going to act upon it, right? To me, that is the ultimate in serving a client is taking all the obstacles out of their way to do what they need to do with their uh, family, right? Now, look, you will never convince someone who doesn't want to do, already do what they want to do. So, well, with NLP, you actually can, okay? But in sales, ethically, using it ethically, you can get people to do what they should do for their families, right? At the same time, using the seven-step submarine will minimize your time with people that don't love their families and want to take care of them right away and maximize your time with the real clients, which, like, like I said, when you're in front of them, typically it's 75%, Okay. And the 25% you don't want because they're going to be your chargebacks. So this is how you get a 90% placement and persistency ratio. Okay, gang. So that is it, man. I can't take questions because we are done, but what time is it? <laughs> it's noon. Oh, I got a call with someone. <laughs> okay, man. Hope you enjoyed it. God bless. Remember, when I... When I send this video out, you need to review it the next day. And then you need to review it in a couple more days. Then you need, you need to review it in about four or five days. I promise you, you will lock everything I've said and then get the book. And the more active learning is by reading. You will actively learn this by reading. But the most important thing is to put it into practice. So the, the, the first exercise I do with you is get to know your children and your spouse. Start asking questions and figure, watch where their eyes go. Listen to the words they use in describing things. And you'll totally peg how they like to process information. So rock on, man. God bless everybody.